Hello and welcome to this session on how to migrate an existing application to serverless. My name is Marcia Vishalva and I will be here telling you some stories. The first story I want to start with is my first encounter with serverless. This was four years ago, five, four years and a half, let's say it like that, because time passes. Um, I was working at this company that was a game company and there we were, I was in this team that was building a kind of Netflix for cartoons kind of application. I have been in that project for like two years and the project maybe was like five years old. We had quite a lot of traffic, around 6 billion views by the time I'm talking about. And the difference with Netflix and our service is that we were not charging our users for accessing the service. They were just, uh, we were just monetizing with advertisement. So what this meant is that our operations needed to be very tight so we could make uh, some profit. So it was beginning of summer and we started receiving some emails from like the boss boss that our system was a little bit in the expensive side that we needed to do some things in order to make it cost efficient. If not, they will need to cancel this project even if it was very successful, if it doesn't make money. Eh. So we were free backend developers in this project and we tried everything that backend developers try. They, um, we try optimizing the code, putting caches everywhere, doing all kind of things. This application was born as a microservice and it ended up being like two or three mini monolith because with time we were too lazy to add new things. Also, it was born in the cloud, so it was purely cloud native. It was born in AWS. But us as developers, we didn't have much knowledge on the cloud and the cloud economics. We understood how to connect into a virtual machine and things like that, but we really didn't understand how the cloud worked. So we did everything that we could imagine as backend developers to improve that code. A couple of months passed and nothing was really changed. We got another mail from the boss boss saying that, well, we needed to do something else. This doesn't have, didn't have any impact on the costs. So we were like, okay, what, what are you talking about? What kind of cost? Can you give us a details of what the costs are? That was our first question. And I think it was very important to ask that question because the cost is a very generic thing. But if you give a really a detailed like, breakdown of what costs what, then you can start taking actions on those individual costs. So we asked that question and it took quite a long time to get a response because nobody really had a breakdown. <laughs> it was quite hard because as we were using a lot of services from our company and we were using a lot of shared accounts, it was very, very hard to get that breakdown. But when we got it, we realized that our costs were in two main areas. The first one and the biggest one was the uh, transfer of data from our data centers to our clients. If you don't know, in the cloud, you pay for the data that goes out. So you need to be very thoughtful on how you're transferring that data out. We were not, and that was a huge uh, expense. And if you're transferring videos, images, and even text, that can add to a lot of money. The second cost that we were having was that we were using a lot of legacy services. Legacy services that were built in the company many years ago. Uh, the company I used to work was a cloud native company, but they started quite early with a cloud that didn't look anything like what it looks today. So a lot of the services were built from scratch in order to support a lot of the features. And later on, they were replaced with cloud native services. But we were behind. We never replaced those services. We were using a lot of services that were only up and running for us. So we needed to migrate out from those services. So those were our biggest 
problems and our biggest uh, cost holes. We needed to fix those urgently. By that time, I was playing during the whole summer with something new that had come out a few months before that was called serverless. I was super excited about it and I told my manager why we don't do a migration to this serverless thing that promised magics and rainbows. And that thing that I said was a totally uneducated um, thing to say. I didn't know much about serverless than deploying the functions to the cloud. I didn't have more than understanding of just the uh, basic lines, but my boss was like just desperate. So he was like, yeah, sure, let's look on it. And that's the beginning of our journey. So in this talk, I want to take you with me in our migration service in our migration journey that maybe was not the most successful, but I think you can learn a couple lessons from our experience. I will also take you in the migration experience of other more successful uh, customers that have migrated to serverless. And I also will share some information to help you out in the migration process. So first I want to introduce myself because I only told you my name, but maybe you don't know who I am. I'm Marta Vishalva, developer advocate for AWS. I joined the company like seven months ago um, and I work in the Nordics in Finland, Sweden, Denmark and all those places. Um, I've been coding all my life. I love teaching and I have a YouTube channel where I post videos every week, every week on serverless cloud computing our software engineer practices. You can find the link in the slides and there you can learn a lot of things very hands on to learn what serverless is. So I want to start with a brief definition on what serverless is. So we are all in the same page. I'm pretty sure a lot of you know what it is and have been playing with it in one way or another. This is a definition that Jeremy Daly gave. The Jeremy Daly is one of the AWS serverless heroes. That means that he's a very big influencer in the serverless area. He evangelized about serverless. He's not an AWS employee. He's just part of the community and he does a lot of work just to make sure that everybody understands what serverless is. And he gave this definition that I think is quite nice of what serverless is. Serverless is a methodology for planning, building and deploying software that maximizes the value by minimizing undifferentiated heavy lifting. What that means is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And this is something that Jared uh, said. Jared is another influencer on the serverless world and he says that when we think of serverless, we need to think if the platform has it, let's use it. If the platform doesn't have it, but the market has it, let's buy it. And then if there is nothing like what we need out, outside there, maybe we need to reconsider our requirements. And if we cannot, we need to build it, but if we build it, we own it. So we don't reinvent the wheel. We take advantage of what is out there and we provide the most value for our stakeholders because at the end of the day, our stakeholders don't care if we are building something with servers and a lot of pain and a lot of work or we are doing it serverless. So serverless is a methodology, it's not a technology. But coming a little bit more to a concrete side, let's talk about what something means, like what it, something has to have in order to be serverless, because, well, it's a methodology, but we also will need to have concrete examples. So in order for something to be serverless, it needs to adhere to four criteria. The first one is that it scales automatically. This means that the scale uh, will go up and down depending on the traffic and in demand of the service, and you don't need to worry. So you can, put out a website in a serverless condition and then your marketing team will make it viral in Korea at two in the morning, you are sleeping and you're relaxed because you know serverless will be able to handle the demand. 
Sure, nothing is unicorns and butterflies. There are always limits and you need to know those limits. A lot of the limits that are in the scalability are soft limits that are put in place as a safe word for you so nobody can abuse of your account. So please make sure that you know your limits and make sure that you know the limits of your service, where it's going to get. And if you need to raise them, just call support and ask for a raise. The second characteristic is that you pay for what you use. And this is something inherently from the cloud. When you're using the cloud, you pay for what you use. That's something that doesn't change when it becomes serverless. The third characteristic is that you don't have to manage infrastructure. And this is something very typical from a serverless component. A serverless component is something that you just use and you don't need to worry much about its configuration and its infrastructure. For example, if you are using virtual machines, even if you are using it in the cloud, you need to decide what kind of CPU, what kind of hard drive, what kind of memory, uh, I don't know, uh, inputs, outputs. You have a lot of parameters that you need to be aware. You need to think as well where it's going to be running, in which data centers or availability zones if you are using AWS. So you need to think about these things. And then you need to configure keys to access that physical machine and put an operating system and then patch it, update it. There is so many things that you need to think. In the other hand, if you're using functions as a service, you just throw your code inside the Lambda platform and the only thing from the infrastructure that you can decide is how much memory you want. And that's it. You don't need to worry about in which data center is going to be stored, what are the security aspects on the operating system, uh, no need to configure any subnets, everything is, comes by the folder. So there is a lot of magic uh, happening there, but I think this makes the serverless center, you don't know which version of the operating system those machines are running, you cannot access those machines, you just have an interface to throw files and get them. And then it's totally high available, it has like many nines of availability, so you don't need to worry about it being uh, available in multiple data centers, it has the fault tolerance, so it, it's a great serverless example. So now we have the basics of what serverless is. And by this point, you know more about serverless than I know, knew back then four years and a half ago. So I told my manager, I want to use serverless. And my manager says, good. But we need to figure out what we are doing here. We, have, we realized that we had to do a migration, that we needed to do some very big architectural changes that we needed to really refactor the whole application and even throw it to the trash. So we had serverless as an option. Uh, we also had some other options, but we were in a very big unknown. So we needed to start digging out a little bit what, how we could find a solution to our problem. So the first unknown that we were handling is the lack of technology knowledge. We knew very little about the cloud, about managed services. We realized that managed services were the way to go. We we're not that sure about functions as a service and lambdas yet because we didn't know how much. It was quite new and we didn't know much about it, but we knew that that was kind of a good path. So we told my, our manager that we didn't know much about AWS and about all these managed services and how we could get some help. My manager said that we didn't have enough money so we could not hire a consultant to sit with us all week for six, seven months. That, that was the time that we were planning that our migration was lasting. So what he could give us was uh, four hours a week of a super expert cloud consultant. So we got this guy that he was amazing. He sit with us four hours a week every Monday after lunch. And he was an expert on serverless and managed services. By that time, serverless had like seven months of life. So it was not that <laughs> there was a lot of experience out there, but he was working with managed services for a long time and with AWS as well. So he came and he started teaching us the basics of the clouds and how cloud economic work and 
all these kind of things. We started our workshop being like a teacher student thing. He was just writing and we were listening. And by the time the project was moving forward, it became more like a peer discussion because he was learning from us. We were learning from him. I think one valuable thing that we learned from that um, training process was that it was very important to train the free developers, the whole team, and have everybody in an equal uh, kind of pa learning path. Because then we were able to, because we understood things in a little bit different way, we were able to have discussions after this expert left. On Tuesday, we were already by ourselves, we were trying to solve problems and we can have discussions. And I think it's super important to train the whole team, no matter how big it is. And sure, there is people that are more like uh, interested and more keen on being uh, new adopters, but it's very important that everybody is in the same page with the technology. So then everybody can teach others as well and you can learn from one another. And as well in a team in general, there is people with different skills that can help uh, as well filling the gaps on the learning uh, path. So it's very, very important to have everybody educated. The other unknown that we have was that, will this solve my problem? We didn't know, we have this crazy idea, but we only had a hunch. And you cannot jump into a migration, a full six, seven, eight my migration with just a hunch. So what we did, was that we started doing minimal viable product, MVPs. We think, what were our biggest problems? We have these two cost holes, but then we needed to think where uh, we could uh, go in more details in those costs uh, and try to have like problems that were more tangible that we could create an MVP and make sure that this technology will solve. So for example, we knew that our delivery of text was very expensive. All the metadata that was going into the application was in JSON, it was a big chunk of JSON and it was expensive. So we create an MVP on how we could make that flow cheaper, faster and more efficient. We try it with serverless and with different flavors and we iterate until we find the best one. Then for example, for other cases, we replace existing components, existing managed services from internal managed services, those that we needed to replace with managed services from AWS. And we did tests and we checked things. So we did a lot of tests and a lot of iterations until we have like an idea on what we could do. This was great for many reasons. The first one is that we learned about serverless by doing, we were trying to solve our problems without the pressure of being these problems going to production. So it was not that clean code, it was just more fun, but, and we were doing a lot of pair programming, workshop programming, uh, everything. So it was a great way of learning. Then we were also understanding our problems in more details because sometimes you have these two blobs like this is expensive and this is expensive but you need to go one more level in the details to understand what you're doing. So now we have our MVPs, we have everything and we are ready to start. So the first thing that everybody needs to do when starting a big project is doing your foundational work. Don't start coding like a crazy rabbit, just do some work. First thing is to define how your application will look. For that, there is the Conway law. The Conway law states that any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization communication structure. So if you have a chunk of people working on one thing, they will produce one service. So if you want to create a microservice structure, for example, you need to use the reverse Conway maneuver. And that means that you structure your organization to match the software you would like to build. When we were working on this project, we never thought about Conway. We did it quite organically. And that's why I'm coming back here. We were free backend developers and we have many microservices that we wanted to do. We didn't want to have a mini monolith anymore. It was very hard to change. It was very painful for many reasons. Um, so we decided that we wanted to have microservices that were more manageable. And for that, we assigned one microservice to each 
team member and we tried to assign microservices that didn't really kind of belong together so you were not uh, kind of uh, fall into the lazy path of putting everything in one blob so that helped us to have nice microservices if you are working in a bigger team you might need to divide your teams in more agile teams we call it in amazon the two pizza teams two family pizzas that can fit that team not bigger than that have them agile have them independently and have them decentralized so they can create their solution in the best way possible so now you have your people now it's time to pick your tools and in this point it's time to pick your programming languages your deployment frameworks your developer tools here you can opt for everybody does the same or every project choose their own tool that's a talk a different talk uh, what is better you need to choose and be aware of what are the benefits and uh, disadvantages of having this uh, everybody picks their own uh, against everybody has the same and the same for the frameworks and then for developer tools the important thing of when you're building microservices with serverless or a distributed application in the cloud is that you must use infrastructure as code infrastructure as code will help you in all kind of things to minimize the risk and the bugs of your application to make your infrastructure changes repeatable unpredictable and all the infrastructure changes will go through the same path as your code i like to put all my infrastructure in the same repository and in the same projects that uh, the code that it belongs so i will make the infrastructure for a particular i will talk about the structure of a project in a moment but everything will be lumped together in a repository so the infrastructure and the code are very close the next thing you need to build is your ci cd pipeline if you are migrating something then you already have one i imagine you can use the same make sure that it supports serverless components in general nowadays they all do if not inside aws or any cloud application you can find different solutions that will help you build your pipeline but this is super important to have automated release process testing process deployment process you don't want to have manual deployments in place that's slow that's error prone and you will deploy a lot when you are working with serverless applications and the last part but not the least important is to have a monitoring and observability um, kind of tool set that you're familiar with and it works this is something we failed dramatically four and a half years ago in our project because by then there was no monitoring concept on how to monitor serverless applications nobody really understood how to do it there was no services out there and it was it was one of the biggest pains that we handle have to have during that the migration it was super horrible but nowadays there's so many tools there's internal tools in your cloud uh, platform there is external tools that are very good at handling monitoring and observability so have that set up from the first day and it's also very important to enable tracing from the first day because the moment you start having problems and need to debug your application debugging on the cloud is very hard and you will be so thankful for those traces that go through 20 different services and show you the life of a message around your application so important so now you have your foundational work you might not be sure if you have taken the right decision but you will need to live with it and, and I think the strategy I will talk now about free migration strategies and when we talk about the migration strategy number three that is the one I would recommend then you can try this out if you choose migration strategy one or two you need to be very sure about your, mic <laughs> your foundational work because you don't get to try it the strategy number one is the big rewrite I will just mention this strategy because it's the one that we did and it failed very much so please don't do it so we were in our project we have our mvps and now with that we felt so confident we have our foundational work we have decided what tools we have decided everything and we have mvps and we were so confident that we could migrate this thing very fast 
I don't know if you have heard, but there is this uh, saying that in software projects has the first 90% and the second 90%. That's how it goes with migrations. You never finish. So this is a horrible strategy. It, it, it only has disadvantages. You start very motivated. With time, you lose motivation. You feel like shit. You never get to try any of your foundational work until the day of deployment. If you get to the day of deployment, as we did, it's the worst day of your life. You suffer, you cry, nothing works. And and, and going to production with something that never that you wrote like seven months ago, it's just painful. So no, don't do it. Strategy number two, the monolithic function. And this strategy I also don't recommend, unless one thing. But let's see what is this. This is to move your existing monolith to a big function. ta -da! It might sound crazy, but there is many examples online of that. Even though there is even, I will give you some tools that you can do this. Because it's, it's not that a crazy idea. If your application is too big, you can move it to Fargate. Fargate are serverless containers. So you will get some of the benefits of going to serverless, but with containers. If you do this, you don't get any benefit of going to serverless. And it's just like, meh. I only encourage this if you want to migrate from your on-prem or from another cloud to the cloud that you are going to build your serverless application because in order to do strategy number three that is the one that i will endorse so much you need to have your monolith in the cloud so if you don't have it you need to do this so these are some tools that can help you for node.js you have this and for java you have that you can take a picture of the screen and we can now move on to the strategy number three the strategy that works many times and I will show you at the end of this a, a good use case of this strategy and but I have heard so many stories of customers successfully going through the strategy and succeeding this strategy is a strangle pattern you might heard it basically you have a monolith and you start strangling it until you get all the services out from it Either you get all the services out or you have a small enough monolith that you don't care anymore. I think this comes from the fig plant that goes and strangles a tree and then the tree dies and you only have like the fig plant that has the kind of shape of the tree. <laughs> I need to dig a little bit more on that, but I'm pretty sure it comes from there. So basically you will have this monolith with one database and you need to start breaking up everything. The API, the database and the code itself. So for doing that, let's dig into the strangler patterns in five nice steps. Yeah. So the first thing I want to show you is our application, an example application. So it's a little bit easier to talk on concrete things. This is a typical inventory managed application with some customer information, orders, information, items, and things like that. Then we have a layer that is handling the connections to the database. If you're using Java, you might have something like a Hibernate, you can make your own, whatever. Then there is a mi very mix of the business logic all mixed up together. And on the top, we can find an authentication user manager layer, the typical, that will give permissions for you to access some particular data and do some particular things. So, Step number one, find the themes in the code. What is this? This is to find the bounded context in the code and putting it together. This is something that in general, even people that build monolith have and do it. They put packages or modules and they put their business logics inside those. In general, that's there. But if it's not, then you need to do it. So a package put all the content of something that belongs together in a package. One important thing when you are building these packages, even if your monolith already have these packages, because you want to migrate out from here, is to think about these packages about uh, being your future microservices. One thing that I like from Sound Newman uh, is that he said that the 
size of a microservices is something that can be rewritten in two weeks. And I think that's something super important to have in mind. I like to build my microservices with that mentality because that helped me to have small enough microservices that doesn't uh, make my life complicated and I can change them. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So when you are building these packages and modules, have that in mind that you want to build them, that they have enough business logic to be rewritten in two weeks. So then this struggling process will go very fast and things will be all happy, happy, joy, joy. So then by the end of your step one, it will look something like this. The only thing that changed is now that the business logic is organized. Step two, organizing the data. This change still happens inside the monolith. And this change is about your um, layer that connects to the database. We want to break it down. Now you have built the packages and now you need to build break that data layer. When you're breaking that data layer, you have to have in mind a couple of things. The tables that belong to that particular data layer are the ones that are related to the package that is on top. So you need to start giving ownership to the tables to some particular packages. And that can be hard. That can mean that you might need to duplicate data, that you might need to do multiple round trips to the database. Because before you just were doing one join between multiple tables, but now the, um, from one point to another table, if it doesn't own it, you cannot access it. So let's look at an example of what I'm meaning. So you want to get from the customers, you want to get all the orders with all the details. And we have the customer ID order ID table that will give me all the orders from a customer. And then there is the order ID with all the order information table that will give me all the details for a specific order. So if I want to do like in traditionally, I will just do the showing and we'll get all the information. But now we cannot because the customer uh, manager, the database customer manager doesn't have access to the order ID order info table. So what it needs to do, it first will go and get all the orders from the customer ID. Then it will go with those orders ID and ask to the order manager for all the details of all these orders. And that will go to the database, return the records and return them to the other one. This is painful, but that's how it's going to happen when you have multiple microservices. You don't want microservices to access data from all them other microservices without having an API in the middle that makes everything very complex. So now step three comes. Now you have done your work in your monolith. You have a very tidy monolith that is ready to be migrated. So now you need to start migrating with the strangler pattern. You will need to choose what you want to migrate. And then in this case, rebuild it as a serverless component. And voila, it will end up something like this. A step three involves a step four and step five. A step four is about breaking the database, a step five about breaking the API. You need to have these three steps in order to get one service out. So where to start? What I should pick? Should I pick the least critical part of my system? Or should I start with the part that everybody is complaining about the reason I'm doing this migration? Well, if you start with the strategy one, it will be great for getting experience. But if you start with that idea, then by the time you migrated the fifth service, you will be so bored and your stakeholders will be like, what these guys are doing? They are migrating something and they never came back to us. It's been like six months. What's going on? Like then also the system that you are migrating is changing all the time. So you will be having to catch up and, 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 and it becomes very hard. And strategy number two, if you start with the most critical part of your system, as a first thing, it's very hard. You have not tested your foundational work. You don't know much about this technology maybe. And then you're jumping into this huge a responsibility that is migrating that 20% of your code that is giving you 80% of the value of your application. So my recommendation 
is to start with the strategy one, migrate one or two services out of the monolith, get experience, try your foundational work, get confident, feel good, and then move to the most critical part of your application, and then migrate it out, and then that's the plan. And I will show you a working example of this at the end of this presentation. So, I cannot give you a step-by-step -step on how to migrate a monolith into serverless because there is so many things you have in consideration. But I can give you some pointers to think about when you are moving your components to serverless. The first one is the concept of the logical microservice. And this is something I really like. And, and every time you read a serverless influencer, they might have a different take on this. This is my take how I like to organize my code. And I think this way is uh, more aligned to what we are used to and what our brain can handle. So I like to organize a set of Lambda functions and services that connect these Lambda functions and the infrastructure of all these in one kind of logical microservices that I will place in a repository with its own deployment, its own lifecycle, its own database. So all the Lambda functions will be able to access that database. And that's why it's a logical microservice, because if we would like to build this concept of nano service that one Lambda function can have a database, it becomes very crazy. But in this case, these multiple Lambda functions will access this database, but nobody outside of these Lambda functions can access the database. They all need to go through some kind of API to access the data. So that's one thing. The other thing is that all these functions can be deployed independently, but they don't need to. But the logical microservice deployment is totally independent from other logical microservices. So you can just deploy this mi microservice and it doesn't matter what other microservices are doing. So it's a, it's a nice concept that makes your life way easier. Another important concept to have in mind is the concept of evolutionary architecture. And this is something, something very hard for some developers to have in mind because we love over engineering. So we want to create an application with microservices that can be rebuilt into weeks, that have these logical microservices in mind and adheres to the idea of the evolutionary architecture. We want to create modular decoupled architecture that can be replaced later. It can happen many things that we learn, something, a way to do it better, that the cloud provider brings a managed service that does exactly like that, or that we just change or are experimenting or want to try out something. So our architecture will keep evolving all the time. And we want these models to be very easy to take out and be replaced with something else. Another important concept when you are working with serverless is the idea of single responsibility principle. We want Lambda functions to do one thing and one thing only, be small. Smaller functions are easy to test, are way more secure, they perform better, and there is way less code to test and less problems. The thing that smaller functions will bring is that we will need to make all these functions talk together in some way or another. For that, I will talk about two patterns. There are many. The first one is the orchestration pattern. There is a process manager, like orchestra director, that will be telling everybody what to do. It will know the state of everybody and knows how to make the works, the services work together. An example is that uh, getting the order details for customer orders. We will need some kind of uh, organ orchestrator here because we need to get the information from the orders. We need to do maybe a parallel request to get all the order details. And then somebody needs to put all these results together. And for that, we need somebody to be the puppeteer and do this thing. Then we have the uh, other pattern that is the choreography. And the choreography is more like chess, that everybody gets a message and do something about it. So that's a very typical way of doing event-driven architectures that just messages appear and people react on those messages. So it's, uh, it's important that you have in mind that we don't want components talking to each other. Why not? Because this adds a lot of coupling in our application. So 
if we have all the components talking to all the other components, then it's just a mess. So for that, we need to add an event router in the middle. It can be queues, it can be uh, PubSub, it can be an event bus. There is other lots of options, but think about that. This will help to decouple your functions, to make independent releases, to improve your scalability, to have modular code for having uh, evolutionary architectures, easier to maintain, and so many other benefits. So look at these services that will help to decouple your functions. Another thing to have in mind when you're working with this is to replace existing functionality with managed services. For that, we want to replace services like the authentication layer that we have in our service with something that is already managed by AWS, like Cognito. Or even whole things like the analytics pipeline. Uh, we have a need for analytics. We might have that built in our monolith, but we can throw it all to the trash and build it new from uh, serverless components. So it cannot be only one, but it can be a collection of serverless components. The step number four is to break the database. We want to migrate those uh, that database, that tables out from there into new databases. It can be just a new you know, SQL database, or we want to migrate it to SQL or even to files. So think about how to do that. The other thing we want to break is the APIs. We need to keep the APIs compatible with our clients and we want to switch the traffic to the new service gradually. That's very important. That was not there when we did the migration. When we did the migration, it was all or nothing and it was super painful. Um, here we have the one, one service that is the application load balancer that has this idea of weighted target groups. So you can decide what percentage you can give to uh, different target groups. So you can put the monolith and the new service that you just migrate and direct part of your traffic to one or the other and try it out in a very controlled way. So now let's move to the case study to run this presentation up. I will talk about Comic Relief. Comic Relief is an uh, UK based uh, company that takes over the TV from one day with musicians, comedians and all kind of famous people and they want to get donations from the audience by phone, mail, so many ways to get uh, donations and then they will put it in some kind of charity and do something good with that money. What they have, the scaling challenges that they have 350 donations per second in the peak of the day that they are live. And the problem with donations is that they don't want to lose any single of them. If they lose a donation, they might never get it back. So these are events that are very important to keep track of them and to have many fault tolerance things in place to make the system super resilient. So they started their journey more or less the same time that we started our journey, but uh, they started in 2016, they have this architecture when they started, a little monolith uh, with all their content, then they have this page for giving, and then the donate service. The donate service was the service that was in charge of all the donations, that was the critical part and that was the most precious part of code that they have. That was the 20% of the code that brings 80% of the value. In 2017, they started migrating. They started using the strangler pattern with the strategy that I told you, first start migrating something that is not that important. So they picked the least important thing that they have, that was an image gallery, and they migrated to serverless, React, and all the fancy new things that were happening in 2017. Then in 2018, they migrated out more services. Now they were more confident. They also built some kind of libraries and helpers to start making this migration faster and better. In 2019, they migrated the donate service. They migrated that service that was very scary into uh, serverless. So now they're in the most critical thing has been migrated. And the architecture looks something like this. You can find it online in that link. But what it has in particular, very specific, this architecture is the amount of resiliency that is built in, in order to catch everything. All donations are getting catch. No donation if left behind. And this is just a view of the cost in March 
2015, before starting any migration, this was the cost of the system, $84,000, that's crazy. And then in March of 2019, the cost was $5,393, from which only 92 was that serverless part. So that's pretty crazy. Most of the other costs were for the Drupal things. So if you want to donate, now they have the system that you can donate all year round. So that's really good and, and go and donate. So to finalize, just a brief uh, reminder that decompose your monolith for being agile, to have evolutionary architecture, to be able to change things as things change, not to be stuck in one architecture forever, automate everything, have CI, infrastructure as code, everything, use tools, that are standardized across your projects, decide what tools you're going to use, what programming languages, what frameworks, what developer tools, and use infrastructure as code. I will say it always, use infrastructure as code. And again, here are the steps for migrating, do your foundational work, move your monolith to the cloud, find the themes of the code, organize your code nicely, organize your data layer, move the code to serverless in a nice, graceful way, taking advantage of all the serverless benefits, break the database, break the API, and repeat five to seven until you're done. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, my DMs on Twitter are always open. I'm always answering questions there. So interact with me in Twitter. I will be more than happy to answer any of the questions. Thank you very much. Have a great day in this conference and bye bye.